Welcome to the folks here and the folks who are joining us online. Um, really incredibly interesting topic today, which is uh, atrial fibrillation and the research that we've done to try to understand its causes and how to prevent it and how lifestyle interacts with the risk of atrial fibrillation. Um, and so the title is Lifestyle and Atrial Fibrillation, Adventures in Clinical Research. So you hear stories about how uh, our speaker has thought through these issues and made really seminal contributions to our understanding of this incredibly common arrhythmia, probably increasingly common as people are wearing watches and other devices trying to detect it. Uh, so our speaker is Greg Marcus, who's professor of medicine here at UCSF, associate chief of cardiology for research. Uh, in the division at UCSF Health and the inaugural endowed professor of atrial fibrillation research. The only one in the country, I'm guessing. I don't, there can't be very many. Uh, he's an active clinician, a superb teacher, and also a uh, prodigious researcher with more than 300 publications and lots of grants in the area of, uh, of arrhythmias and understanding arrhythmias, particularly AFib. Uh, Greg is uh, also one of the founders and continues to serve as one of the PIs on the worldwide internet-based Healthy Heart Study, as well as the NIH-funded National Infrastructure to Facilitate Mobile Health, uh, called the Eureka uh, Study. Uh, he's also an associate editor of JAMA. Uh, I was uh, interested and pleased to hear he was a graduate of UCSD as a philosophy major, uh, which I'm sure comes in very handy uh, from time to time. Went to med school at GW, did his internship residency, chief residency at Stanford, and then we managed to lure him north to UCSF for his uh, fellowship in cardiology and in electrophysiology, as well as a master's in advanced clinical research at UCSF. So uh, Greg, is a, he's a member of the Association of University Cardiologists and the American Society of Clinical Investigation. So uh, really a stellar member of our faculty and a really important and interesting topic. Greg, thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks so much, Bob, and uh, for all of you for your uh, taking your valuable time and attention here. I hope uh, I can make it worth it. Um, so these are my disclosures. Uh, uh, I'll just comment uh, for a second uh, on the JAMA side. We'll just say uh, we'll, in bl some blatant uh, promotion, please send us your best work. Uh, and then perhaps most importantly, uh, because I will be talking about lifestyle, it's uh, relevant to emphasize that I've received no funding from the food or, or beverage industry, but I have to acknowledge I do love a good cappuccino and I really hate uh, a bad cappuccino. And I can't recommend the coffee shop in the library enough, by the way, which uh, I get no fi financial reward, but certainly selfishly want to keep them open. Uh, okay, so atrial fibrillation, I, I, I suspect the great majority, if not everyone in this audience already knows this is incredibly common. And some uh, of you who are in the hospital may think, well, yeah, I see a lot of atrial fibrillation, but it's not really that common in, in the general population. But amazingly, once we hit the age of 40, our lifetime risk for atrial fibrillation is one in four. Uh, this uh, figure on the left here, uh, produced by Jean-Jacques Nubiap, who is a postdoc working with me and is in the audience today, uh, presented at, at AHA, is really hot off the presses uh, the latest information we have on the best estimate of the U.S. prevalence of AFib, which we estimate is actually about 4%. And you can see, we know atrial fibrillation becomes more common with age. It really skyrockets. Uh, it's, it's certainly not unheard of, even in uh, individuals in their 30s and 40s, and I see a lot of those in my EP clinic. But once one hits 85, it's about 31%, as far as we can tell, have atrial fibrillation. So is it important? We know it's common. Does it actually matter? Well, data suggests that those with atrial fibrillation have a reduced quality of life to the same extent as those who have suffered a heart attack. Uh, clearly, it's one of the leading causes of stroke, but those clots don't uh, necessarily just travel to the brain. They can travel elsewhere in the body and cause heart attacks. There's evidence that atrial fibrillation is associated with dementia. So maybe it's not just a fairly large clot big enough to cause a manifest stroke, but maybe very small clots or even some sludge uh, that causes cognitive decline over time. Uh, it also predicts worsening kidney function and is associated with the heightened risk for death. 
Now, many of you may think, okay, but that's, how do you know that's causal? Couldn't that just be that that's the, the, the type of substrate that travels with atrial fibrillation? That explains it all. And we all remember the AFFIRM trial, which failed to show a benefit of rhythm control versus rate control. And I wanted to, this isn't the emphasis of today's talk and is deserving of a full talk, but I do wanna point out there were recent, uh, recently released guidelines just at the end of last year. I was fortunate to be on this uh, writing committee, so quite familiar with them. And my role was mainly on the lifestyle front, but, and I apologize if this font is too small, the point being here that there's a greater emphasis emphasis on the evidence base of pursuing and maintaining sinus rhythm and the, and the apparent true benefit in terms of hard outcomes for obtaining and maintaining sinus rhythm, providing very compelling evidence that atrial fibrillation really is causal when it comes to all those adverse outcomes I described. Now, how do we obtain and maintain sinus rhythm? Well, there you're talking about either drugs Many of them work very well and are very well tolerated, but they all come with potential adverse consequences or invasive ablation, which similarly can work amazingly well. And I, I do these procedures frequently and, and I've been amazed at the advances here and, and how safe and, and effective this procedure has become, but there are still complications and it doesn't work for everyone. <clears throat> and ultimately, of course, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. So can we think about preventing atrial fibrillation? And this is uh, where the field is moving. Uh, I think even today, if someone says, well, yeah, you know, I'm a cardiologist and you ask, well, what kind of cardio cardiology do you practice? And they say, oh, I'm a preventive cardiologist. Usually that will invoke uh, the vision of someone who's preventing a coronary disease and a heart attack. But we're at the stage now where that can be applied to the field of electrophysiology and especially AFib more than any other. And I hope to convince you of that. So these are the lifestyle factors I'll be uh, discussing as we go through. And this is not just me. Uh, so the American Heart Association now considers lifestyle and risk factor uh, modification one of four pillars in treating atrial fibrillation along with anticoagulation, rate control, and rhythm control. Uh, I was privileged to be part of this NHLBI workshop that focused on research priorities in atrial fibrillation. And the main priority was indeed lifestyle factors and risk factor modification, things that are uh, predominantly under the control of the individual patient or the member of the lay public. So I'll just touch briefly on physical activity and atrial fibrillation. So there are multiple observational studies to show that in general, people who engage in more physical activity seem to have a lower risk of developing atrial fibrillation. And among those with atrial fibrillation, more physical activity is associated with uh, less recurrence. Now, one of the things that can make this a little tricky to talk about and more complex than it otherwise would be is that there really does seem to be a heightened risk of atrial fibrillation in very highly trained endurance athletes. So we're talking about people that are engaged in endurance exercise on average four hours a day, every day. Uh, there's some evidence that cyclists in particular, and, and this certainly bears out if you uh, come to uh, hang out with me in my EP clinic, but also cross country skiers, some long distance runners. Um, my feeling is that even though that's true and, and the risk is a little higher, that the great majority of the time that is not relevant to the great majority of our patients where uh, encouraging more physical activity is gonna be to their overall benefit. And even among those atrial fibrillation patients that experience the disease in the setting of conducting or, or engaging in endurance uh, exercise, they're deriving many other uh, benefits from that exercise. And there's good evidence there's, their other risks are much reduced. Now, most importantly, I em tried to emphasize that that's all observational. There actually is a randomized control trial, and this is one of a few in atrial fibrillation on this subject that favors more physical activity. So this is from uh, Prash Sanders in, in Adelaide, Australia, uh, where the story goes, so, so 
Prash is a very busy interventional electrophysiologist. They do a lot of AFib ablations and they have a really long waiting list. And so the story goes that they had all these patients waiting. Many of them were quite obese uh, to have their AFib ablation, sometimes on a waiting list for as much as a year. And so they tried to figure out, okay, what can we do for these patients in the meantime? Let's start this risk factor modification clinic and staff it with a, you know, a nurse. And then they decided to randomize their patients and found that indeed the, the patients randomly assigned, and these were all obese patients, importantly, those randomly assigned to this predominantly weight loss focused uh, management program exhibited a substantial reduction in their atrial fibrillation. Some uh, didn't have an AFib recurrence, some who had persistent AFib all the time, their AFib actually turned to paroxysmal or even uh, melted away. So good evidence from a randomized trial of causality here, that at least in obese patients, more physical activity, or in this case, sedentary behavior is promoting atrial fibrillation, physical activity, weight loss can reduce it. Okay, moving on to smoking, <clears throat> where like everything else uh, uh, it is not good. Uh, it increases the risk for AFib, and this is in multiple studies, multiple meta-analyses, even after adjusting for coronary disease and the other adverse consequences of smoking. Now, smoking is unique among AFib risk factors is that in that it's the only one that increases the risk you can give someone else atrial fibrillation. And interestingly, especially in kids, uh, we hope that these data, and I'll share some of them in a moment, may actually be very compelling evidence to help people to quit. There is good evidence that uh, it helps with smoking cessation if, the, if there's a issue of helping people other than the smoker, uh, him or herself. So this is data from Shalini Dixit, who is now just recently joined our faculty. She was a UCSF medical student when she did this, took a year off. She was also UCSF medical resident and cardiology fellow, as hopefully many of you know. And we wanted to just look at this question. Uh, does secondhand smoke exposure increase the risk for atrial fibrillation? So we used data from our Healthy Heart study that Bob kindly mentioned, where we had a validated secondhand smoke uh, questionnaire <clears throat> and indeed found, yep, that seems to be associated with atrial fibrillation. But when we drilled down into the specific questions that were most strongly associated with atrial fibrillation, it turned out it was actually exposure while in the womb. Uh, so there was a question, did your, either your parents smoke when your mother was pregnant with you or when they were kids? <clears throat> and in this figure, we show an interaction by lone atrial fibrillation versus not, demonstrating that it's really the people with lone atrial fibrillation, meaning atrial fibrillation in the absence of any other established or uh, apparent cardiovascular risk factor, that those are the individuals that experience the greatest heightened risk of AFib in the setting of uh, secondhand smoke exposure while in development, essentially. Subsequently, Chris Grow, when he was a fellow with us, uh, he's now at the University of Utah, uh, took advantage of the Framingham Heart Study, which is this beautiful study for many reasons, but one is that there are multiple generations uh, and you can link up the offspring, now you can link up the grandchildren of the original cohort, I think uh, soon, if not already, great-grandchildren of the original cohort. So in this study, we looked at parental smoking as a predictor of offspring AFib, and indeed found that there was a highly statistically significant relationship. Now, some of that was mediated by the fact that not surprisingly, the kids of smoking parents were themselves more likely to smoke. We have another ongoing cohort study that is much larger where the moms were actually even more carefully and comprehensively phenotyped while pregnant in the 1950s and 60s and are analyzing data of their offspring now. So uh, more on this to come. So how might tobacco smoke lead to atrial fibrillation? We don't know. There are many potential explanations. So maybe it's an effect of the nicotine Maybe it's these, uh, the other cardiovascular comorbidities that we just didn't adequately adjust for. We know that uh, smoking and nicotine leads to autonomic aberrations and that those sorts of changes can trigger atrial fibrillation. It's also well known that inhalation of particulate matter kicks up inflammation 
And inflammation is very clearly a sufficient substrate to cause AFib. We see that not, not uncommonly. And when any, whenever anyone has a thoracotomy, a pericardium, uh, you know, they, they open the pericardium and cause pericarditis. Um, so if that's true though, that last one, then that uh, begs the question, what about other drugs that are inhaled? Might they also be harmful? So this uh, study uh, was done by Anthony Lin, who was a medicine resident here now at Duke, where we leveraged this database we use for much of our research uh, of more than 23 million uh, Californians seeking care in the hospital emergency room or an outpatient surgical facility, and found that after adjusting for all the confounders that were available, methamphetamine, cocaine, opiates, and even cannabis were all associated with a heightened risk uh, for atrial fibrillation. And, and this, especially the cannabis, I think runs a bit contrary to some uh, at least perceived conventional wisdom that, oh, cannabis is, must be healthy because it's natural. Uh, and I often tell my patients, well, you know, arsenic is natural. Uh, tobacco is natural. Cocaine is natural. Uh, so good evidence that these inhaled substances, almost all certainly also substances that affect the autonomic tone uh, in, may increase the risk for atrial fibrillation. Okay, switching now to alcohol, the most commonly consumed drug uh, in the world. So there have been many observational studies on this subject and several meta-analyses now. This is one uh, where investigators look at baseline and they determine how much all the Research participants tend to drink, they follow them over time, and they determine that on average, there's some heterogeneity here, it's not universal. Those who drink more appear to be at higher risk of developing atrial fibrillation in the future. Then there, the, there's the question, well, if you're encountering a patient who's been drinking all their life, they're now 65, 70, does it matter? Is the cat out of the bag? Can you still influence their risk for atrial fibrillation? So Shalini again, uh, first authored this paper uh, using data from uh, the atherosclerosis risk and community study and showed that drinkers who subsequently abstained actually did exhibit a substantially lower risk of atrial fibrillation compared to those that continued to consume alcohol. Most recently, Alex Voskoboynik, who is a EP now back in Australia, uh, with Peter Kissler in Melbourne there. Alex was a EP fellow uh, with us for a while and he very generously referred to that paper from Shalini as some inspiration for this, uh, which was his PhD project. He was actually answering the reviewers while he was an EP fellow here. And what they did was a very important, very clever study. They took patients uh, with atrial fibrillation that drank heavily and randomly assigned them <clears throat> to try not to drink try to be abstinent uh, versus allowing them to drink alcohol. And they found that those randomly assigned to abstinence exhibited a substantial reduction in the burden of their atrial fibrillation. So this is really uh, one of the first studies to demonstrate, again, as did the other randomized trial, but in this case related to alcohol, compelling evidence of a causal relationship. This is a randomized trial. This is not due to confounding. So what about just one drink a day? I mentioned those individuals, first of all, they already had AFib. Uh, secondly, they drank heavily. What about a drink a day? Is that okay? Is that even healthy? Uh, to cut to the chase, the answer is we don't know. And I'll, I'll comment on that a little bit uh, more in a few slides. There have been two studies ostensibly large enough to have adequate power to address this question, both European on the left here from Renata Schnabel, this is mainly uh, continental Europe. And they found that one drink a day was indeed, this is among people who started out without AFib, was associated with a heightened risk for AFib small and the risk goes up the more people drank, but one drink did uh, confer a higher risk. In contrast, Chris Wong, some of you may remember was a EP fellow with us uh, and went back to Australia a lot. I recognize a lot of Australians here. Uh, they've all done uh, great work. Um, did this analysis with Samuel II uh, using data from the UK Biobank, an even larger study, and they actually found this J-shaped 
a relationship that is commonly observed in alcohol research where people who drank a drink a day actually had the lowest risk of atrial fibrillation. This seemed to be driven uh, by those drinking red wine in particular. Now, maybe that's because that's especially confounded, or maybe that's because there really is something about red wine, despite what the New York Times has recently said, quoting one of our papers, by the way, uh, that the, the red wine has lost its halo. All this to say that we still don't know uh, the answer as long as one is drinking in moderation, not more than one drink a day. Now, clinically, this idea of the holiday heart syndrome comes from these original observations back in the 70s and 80s that people who drank heavily would come in with a discrete or an acute episode of atrial fibrillation. So what about that? Is that, can you prove that? And how is alcohol leading to atrial fibrillation anyway? So this is a study we conducted, uh, funded by the uh, R01 from the NIAA, where we took patients undergoing AFib ablation and we randomly assigned them to an intravenous infusion of alcohol or ethanol versus a osmolality and volume matched placebo. We used this pharmacokinetic model that's been developed by investigators at Indiana University used at the NIAA where you can enter in uh, the individual's essentially demographics, their, their height and their weight, you start the infusion, and then you uh, obtain serial breathalyzers. These patients were under general anesthesia, but we pre-programmed this model to get these patients uh, up to 0.08% uh, blood alcohol and then clamp it there. Uh, for those who uh, had the placebo, the operators were blinded. So the uh, coordinators had a script. There were two of them, one getting the breathalyzer, the other one writing things down, and they would yell out 0.03%, and they would type that in but uh, to maintain that blinding. We did a very comprehensive cardiac electrophysiology study of the atria, assessing conduction times and refractory periods, how long it takes the cardiomyocytes to electrically recover, which has been shown to be important to the propensity to AFib. And what we found was in the alcohol group alone, this AERP, atrial effective refractory period, how long it takes for the atria to electrically recover, substantially shortened in the pulmonary veins. And we know from our ablation procedures that the pulmonary veins are critical to the initiation and perpetuation of atrial fibrillation. And in the placebo group, we did not see this. Now, to my great chagrin, uh, we were not able to demonstrate a difference in AFib inducibility. Many potential reasons for that. I, I suspect we just had too blunt of a hand, uh, instrument, essentially, that uh, we were just pacing very rapidly, giving high dose isoproteranol. All of these patients were prone to AFib, uh, and so we may not have been able to, to see a difference. It may also be that we tried it too quickly. These were all patients undergoing ablation, and thankfully my colleagues uh, were patient enough to do all this, and the patients were generous enough to, uh, to, to consent to this. So we had to get right to the ablation. We didn't have time to wait to see what happened. And in fact, in a natural environment, as we showed in this other aim for that same grant, there does appear to be a bit of a delay, although a heightened risk of AFib within a few hours. So in this study, we took patients with paroxysmal AFib and fit them with a continuously recording ethanol or alcohol sensor while they wore a continuously recording EKG and found that indeed when they consumed alcohol, the risk for a discrete atrial fibrillation episode went up substantially, tended to peak uh, at around four hours. So providing the first really objective evidence this didn't rely on any sort of self-report uh, that yes, indeed, acute alcohol consumption leads to a given atrial fibrillation episode. Now, one of the problems or the main problem with most observational studies is this issue of confounding. We have our predictor, we have our outcome, maybe we find a relationship, maybe we don't. Uh, and we do all sorts of things to try to mitigate against the possibility there's some other factor that's actually causal, that's confusing us or tricking us. Uh, and so there's a lot of interest in leveraging observational data because it's much more feasible to obtain uh, observational data. Uh, and yet try to get around this confounding. And one way to do that is with something called an instrumental variable. And this is just an example of some of the adventures 
uh, in clinical research in addition to giving IV alcohol to, to our patients. Uh, so an instrumental variable uh, is something that, at, at least as far as we can tell, is tightly correlated with the predictor, but as far as we know, is not associated with the outcome except potentially through the predictor. And the idea is that this can help mitigate against at least conventional confounding. So we've done this in a couple of ways in alcohol studies. So the first uh, was, uh, this is with Jonathan Dukes, uh, who was a UCSF medical student. And then uh, after going to Hopkins for residency, came back for fellowship. Uh, we leveraged the fact that in Texas, there are different alcohol sales laws by county. So we showed that in counties that were wet, that had more liberal alcohol sales laws, there was more AFib. Actually, interestingly, less MI in those counties compared to the dry counties. But in this instrumental variable analysis in the same paper in the BMJ, we looked at seven counties that switched their alcohol sales laws during our five-year study period. So we had data on every hospitalization in Texas over five years. All of them happened to go from dry to wet. And first in validation, we showed that yes, indeed, alcohol abuse codes went up, alcoholic liver disease codes went up, and atrial fibrillation did indeed uh, go up. In another instrumental variable analysis, we made use of these commercially available Bluetooth-enabled breathalyzers, where I was able to get a hold of some data from uh, more than 20,000 users around the world of this device. Kirsten Oshbacher, when she was on the faculty with us, applied a machine learning algorithm to these data to demonstrate we could predict when someone's blood alcohol was going to be was going to exceed uh, the legal driving limit. But in this analysis, Sydney Ong, who is now a medicine resident, uh, this is when he was a medical student here. Uh, uh, published this in Nature Cardiovascular Research. And essentially what we did was first, to empir we empirically determined, based on those alcohol measurements, are there certain recurrent nationally recognized events associated with a greater likelihood that individuals use their devices, as well as uh, similar events when the blood alcohol was greater than 0.08%. And we identified those dates that are listed here. So these are not days or events where we just assumed, yeah, we think they're probably associated with more alcohol. These were empirically derived. Then we looked at every emergency department visit for AFib over about a 15 year period and found that yes, indeed, compared to other days, these days using this instrumental variable of events associated with alcohol use, those were associated with substantially more AFib visits to the ER. We even had a neg negative control here uh, for SVT where we did not uh, find that relationship. So we hope these are, this is a sort of a population level evidence using an instrumental variable that not only is there a relationship between alcohol and AFib, but there's an acute relationship uh, between alcohol and AFib. So I mentioned uh, the recent guidelines and the data I just presented helped to support uh, this class one uh, now recommendation uh, that patients with AFib seeking a rhythm control strategy uh, should minimize or eliminate alcohol consumption to reduce AFib recurrence uh, and burden. So what do I tell my patients about alcohol? And here, I think it's important to distinguish those without atrial fibrillation versus those with atrial fibrillation. So for those without, first of all, if they don't drink, fine, I don't tell them to start. If they like to drink, I strongly recommend they avoid consuming probably more than one, certainly more than two drinks in any 24 hour period. And to keep it on average to no more than seven drinks a week, ideally drinking it with dinner, ideally a, a low alcohol, high polyphenol drink as in the Mediterranean pattern style of drinking where there's the best evidence uh, of minimal harm, maybe even some benefit. As I alluded to earlier, there's been this interesting pendulum swing in the media uh, where 10, 15 years ago, it was quite positive uh, for moderate drinking. Now it's very negative. And I would um, encourage all of you, when you read these studies about the harms of alcohol or how there's no, no such thing as a health, healthy level of alcohol, to notice uh, how they will jump to the causal conclusion or the very, I, I think, overconfident conclusion of harm uh, 
Uh, whereas I think, and I, uh, we need a randomized trial, which is we've been trying to get funded, meaning a Mediterranean uh, pattern of drinking, meaning no more than one glass of red wine with dinner on average five to seven days of the week versus abstinence. Maybe it is harmful, uh, but we can only know from a randomized trial. And there actually is very strong, compelling evidence of some uh, benefits, admittedly, almost all observational, although there's even a, some small randomized trials to support this, that moderate alcohol consumption may reduce the risk for diabetes, MI, may reduce the risk for certain cancers even, including le leukemia and lymphoma, and perhaps mortality. Now, very importantly, and I think this is behind some of the very well-intended uh, concern about drinking any alcohol, is that it's not that more is better. So this is a study we did with uh, Ziggy Whitman when he was a fellow here, uh, where we looked, used that database I've described uh, before, looked at any sort of alcohol use disorder code. So not relying on self-report of alcohol, uh, not surprisingly, that predicted AFib, it predicted heart failure. But despite evidence that a drink a day may reduce the risk for MI, those who drink in excess experience a substantially heightened risk for MI. So very important, heavy drinking is not cardioprotective and, and, and is almost certainly harmful. There's really no question of equipoise there. So for those who do have atrial fibrillation, I'm quite a bit more strict given the amount of evidence we have. So what I tell them is, look, if you really want to do everything you can to avoid an episode of AFib, I would just stop drinking alcohol. Uh, if they live with someone else, I encourage them to do the same because it really helps if in the same house, they're not purchasing alcohol, they're not drinking it regularly. If they do like to drink, I, I try to encourage them to minimize their consumption as much as possible. Now, there are some patients who say, you know what, drinking a really good glass of red wine is very important to me and my quality of life. And it's important, I think, as physicians, we have to take the whole patient into account. Um, and I do feel that as an electrophysiologist, it's my job to help them with their disease, with their atrial fibrillation. And perhaps if we ablate them, maybe they can have a little bit of alcohol. I, I again, am, am very clear, you have to avoid uh, excess uh, alcohol, but, but we simply don't know what happens if someone is able to maintain sinus rhythm on, via some therapy, is alcohol okay for them? Uh, this is a, a, a more recent R01 uh, that a couple of my research coordinators are here, uh, Gabby and, and Gracie and the audience um, are helping to enroll in as well as some others I will tell you about. This is a mobile app-based study that we uh, built using our Eureka digital research platform uh, that Bob mentioned. Incidentally, Eureka is available to any interested investigator. I'll give you several examples of our use of it. So feel free to reach out anytime if you may be interested uh, in, in building your own study on the platform. We're doing this in collaboration with American College of Cardiology that has a national AFib ablation registry, but they only collect data from the visit in the hospital. And with this, we're able to collect patient reported outcome data, weekly data regarding lifestyle factors such as alcohol, uh, caffeine, sleep, et cetera. Also look at complications and connect to various devices like Apple Watches or, or a live core cardiomobiles devices. Now, you may be thinking uh, thus far, uh, man, this is kind of a downer. You're telling me you know, it's raining outside. I still have to go for my run. Uh, you know, alcohol may not be good, even, even at a minimum. Do you have any good use, uh, any, any good news uh, for us? Uh, and this is where coffee uh, might come in. Now, interestingly, the conventional wisdom is that coffee leads to arrhythmias. And in fact, professional society guidelines have warned against caffeine consumption to avoid arrhythmias. Uh, coming to yet another uh, study of, uh, from Shalini's very productive year, we made use of uh, Halter studies in the cardiovascular health study. And, and I can't emphasize enough how valuable these data are because these Halters were not obtained for medical purposes. These were not people who had palpitations or come to see their doctor. This is a NIH funded community-based or population-based cohort where these participants were randomly assigned to wear a Halter. So this is the best we can get 
at understanding what's really going on in the general population and avoid the usual selection bias of those coming to seek to, for medical care. And we looked at very common arrhythmias that we all have, PACs, PVCs, non-sustained SVT, non-sustained VT, and coffee consumption. And I was really bummed to find we could demonstrate no positive relationship between coffee consumption and these arrhythmias. Uh, and I felt really bad. I'm, I'm sorry, Shalini, this didn't work out. Uh, let's you know, submit it to this, um, what was at the time a fairly new journal, uh, the Journal of American Heart Association, and they just snatched it right up. And it was covered by the New York Times. And I realized, oh man, people really care about their coffee. This, you know, I guess this negative finding that I thought was like a ho-hum actually may be important. So more recently, E.J. Kim, who was an EP fellow with us, made use of the UK Biobank. And we found this very interesting, but very consistent backwards relationship. So the outcome here is all arrhythmias. And we found that those who drank more coffee had less arrhythmias. Now, some of this could be selection bias or, or misclassification in that maybe some of this, there were some people that drank a little coffee, had palpitations, so they never drank coffee again, and we, we missed that. That doesn't seem to explain this kind of dose response relationship, but we did wanna do a little bit more than the usual sort of observational uh, report, uh, which brings us back to our instrumental variable analysis and a specific type of that, that uh, hopefully uh, many, if not all of you have heard of called Mendelian randomization. So Mendelian randomization is the same idea, but in this case, you're making use of a genetic variant that is at least ostensibly somewhat randomly assigned. It's not actually totally random, but it's fairly random. Uh, and you have to find one or several that are associated with your predictor of interest. And as far as you can tell, as far as you can work out, not associated with your outcome. And so this is commonly done in alcohol-related research where those who are faster alcohol metabolizers have been shown to drink more alcohol. So we showed in UK Biobank that the faster caffeine metabolizers drank more caffeine. And then we just looked at that genetic variant as our predictor, and we could find no evidence of a heightened risk of really any arrhythmia associated with uh, either a polygenic score or one of the most common, uh, commonly investigated genetic variants there. This and other studies have actually informed the most recent guidelines that actually now include a class three that for patients with AFib, recommending caffeine abstention to prevent AFib ep episodes is of no benefit. We did put this caveat in, although it may reduce symptoms in patients who report caffeine triggers uh, or, or, or where caffeine worsens AFib symptoms. I'll, I'll comment on this in a little bit. There isn't great objective evidence for that, but we acknowledge it's possible. There, there are some people, and certainly patients do sometimes tell us that caffeine triggers their AFib. I have found though, when I ask my patients about that uh, and I ask them, you know, do you drink coffee? Like, nope, why not? Well, it could cause my AFib. Like, oh, did it actually trigger your AFib? No, 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 my doc, when I, when I developed a diagnosis of AFib, my doctor told me I should stop because it could trigger my AFib. So it's a little bit of a, a circular thing. That being said, I suspect there may be some people uh, where it may yet be important. Now, the best way to mitigate against confounding, of course, is to randomize your predictor. But the issue, as I alluded to, is the feasibility of doing that. So we've tried to think about, well, how can we make this more efficient and, and doable? And one way to do it is to leverage those very common arrhythmias I've referred to. So we all have PACs, premature atrial contractions. And in this, uh, what's turned out to be very important study from Tommy Dooland, uh, when he was a medicine resident, now a EP uh, attending and, and partner of, of, of ours, uh, published in the Annals of Internal Medicine, using that very valuable data set from the cardiovascular health study, showed that the PAC count was the most potent predictor of incident AFib, more potent than a very complex multifaceted Framingham prediction model. And this has really borne out with time, and it fits with our clinical observation that in the EP lab, we sometimes will see triggers coming from the pulmonary veins, and if we can ablate them, we can clearly uh, rid people of their atrial fibrillation. Also in the EP lab, we've learned that heart failure patients with very frequent PVCs, 
uh, especially those who don't have another good reason for their heart failure, if we can get rid of their PVC with an ablation, we can often improve, if not normalize, their ejection fraction. So in this study, uh, first authored by Jonathan Dukes, we showed that in the general population, those with more PVCs experience a higher risk of developing heart failure. The point being, PACs and PVCs, very common. They're also continuous outcomes, gives you a lot of power. And there are also that the frequency of each is also highly clinically relevant. So this was what, what undergirded our uh, CRAVE trial. CRAVE stands for Coffee and Real-Time Assessment uh, of atrial and ventricular ectopy. Uh, many at UCSF uh, generously uh, and thankfully enrolled as volunteers. So we enrolled 100 individuals, gave them all Fitbits to record step counts and sleep, gave them all uh, Zeo patches to continuously record their heart rhythm, gave them all glucose monitors because there's evidence from large epidemiologic studies that those who drink coffee may experience a lower risk of developing diabetes, we genotyped all of them uh, using spit kits for caffeine metabolism related uh, genetic variants. And then they were randomly assigned to go ahead and drink all the coffee you want today, caffeinated coffee, we made that very clear, versus avoid all caffeine today, one day at a time. Um, and these were uh, communicated uh, 8 p.m. The, the night before and reiterated 8 a.m. the next morning. We actually randomized them in on-off versus off-on pairs. That's not how the, the participants experienced it. They experienced it as one day at a time, but we constructed it that way for a couple of reasons. One, one of the challenges, perhaps not surprisingly, enrolling people was many would say, oh, I can't enroll in that. I can't go without my coffee for a day. I can't do your study. So at least we could tell them, well, you, you're not going to have to go more than two days in a row without coffee. The other is in case the zeo patch came off after five or seven days, at least we, knew, we would know for sure we had uh, uh, equal number of days essentially on each. Also, it helped to assure the outcomes we observed were acute rather than due to cumulative effects. Now, you might say, okay, they were randomly assigned, but how do you know they actually followed their randomization assignment? So we assess that in a few ways. Number one, we asked people to press the button on the Zeo patch whenever they had a drink of coffee. We had validated that in our alcohol sensor study. Two, we asked them every morning, did you actually have any coffee yesterday? Uh, now that does still rely on their self-report, but they didn't really have a reason to lie. But I, I wouldn't blame you for being skeptical uh, about uh, relying on only those sort of uh, participant uh, activity required uh, assessments. So we employed a couple of more. One is this idea of geofencing. So this was Kaylin Wynn, who was a medical student and resident with us before heading to Stanford for cardiology, uh, where we demonstrated this proof of concept using our Eureka platform that we could geofence any publicly known location. In this case, we showed we could geofence visits to hospitals all around the country using our Healthy Heart Study participants. In Crave, we geofenced coffee shops. Finally, we told all of our participants, we will pay for all of your coffee, as long as it's for immediate consumption, as long and it, whether you were supposed to drink it or not, please, we'll pay for it. We're happy to pay for it. We just need the, a receipt with a date stamp on it. So regardless of how we assess this, the uh, compliance was not perfect. But the great majority of the time, the great majority of people really did seem to follow their randomization assignment. So our main outcomes were PAC and PVC counts uh, with the secondary outcomes listed there. The uh, main outcome of PACs was no different between days where, where they consumed coffee versus avoided it, which fits with our AFib data. However, they did experience more PVCs on days randomly assigned to coffee. Also, the more they drank, the more PVCs they had. PACs, we found no such relationship. If anything, the estimate favored less PACs on coffee days, although that did not reach statistical significance. Now, in terms of step counts, in this figure, each of this, these uh, kind of blue-orange pairs are the same person. And in uh, blue is their average step count on days randomly assigned uh, 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 I'm sorry, orange randomly assigned to coffee, blue randomly assigned to avoid it. And hopefully I can convince you the orange is generally higher than the blue. And in fact, 
people took on average about a thousand more steps on days when they were randomly assigned to coffee, about 500 more steps per cup of coffee. And then uh, sleep was perhaps not surprisingly the opposite. So you see the blue here, in this case, that's coffee avoidance is generally higher than the orange. So on average, more sleep. And in fact, about a half hour less sleep on, and this is objectively measured, not relying on self-report on days randomly assigned to consume coffee, about 15 to 18 minutes less sleep per cup. We found no differences uh, in uh, glucose. Now, we did look at interactions by the genetic propensity to metabolize caffeine and first found something that was a little puzzling, perhaps backwards related to PVC. So the faster metabolizers had the most uh, potent relationship between coffee and more PVCs. We still don't really understand why. One potential, potential explanation is that a metabolite of caffeine is actually aminophilin. So it may be aminophilin is more arrhythmogenic in the ventricle. Maybe these people just drank their coffee faster because they metabolize it faster. The sleep data was much more intuitive in the way it panned out. So these slow metabolizers uh, slept on average almost an hour, 50 minutes less on days randomly assigned to co a caffeinated coffee. And interestingly, the fast metabolizers really had no evidence of relationship between less sleep and coffee. So when someone tells you, yep, I can have a cappuccino, go right to sleep, they uh, may be telling the truth. They are probably fast metabolizers. Now you may be wondering about this discordance between the PACs and PVCs, but actually if you think about it, if you see these patients, this does fit with our clinical experience. So patients with high burden PVCs, they're not usually also people with a lot of PACs and, and vice versa. These, this is a figure uh, going back to that paper from, from EJ Kim using data from UK Biobank demonstrating the relationships between individual types of arrhythmias. And we see that this relationship uh, of lower risk with more coffee is really driven by the supraventricular arrhythmias. So AFib, flutter, SVT. Uh, bear in mind, the outcome ascertainment here in UK Biobank is really by ICD-9, ICD-10 code. So it's not like they're wearing continuous monitors. And interestingly, the PVCs, it just so happens, are the only ones on the right side of one, on the, uh, not statistically significant, but on the side of perhaps a little higher risk. So I would say that these data are actually consistent with our findings from Crave. Now, some of you may be thinking, but isn't there some heterogeneity? Isn't it the case there are some people who can drink all the alcohol they, they want, they're never gonna get AFib. Uh, some people uh, who, who drink just a drop and they get uh, AFib. Uh, we think so, there probably is. This uh, motivated our, what we called I stop AFib randomized trial, which was actually designed really in a very meaningful way alongside AFib patients, where we started with what do you AFib patients want us investigators to study? And they told us, we want you to study triggers. No one's looking at triggers. Uh, and we think that that's really important. The things that we do that trigger a discrete episode. So we built this I stop AFib randomized trial on Eureka where paroxysmal AFib patients, uh, this is completely remote. So they could be anywhere in the US that wanted to test a trigger were randomly assigned to just tracking their AFib versus undergoing their own customized N of one randomized trials. For those undergoing their N of one trials, uh, they would be assigned a week at a time to expose versus avoid they would report AFib daily. They also connected up a live core cardiomobile devices for ECG data. And when they were done with their N of one trials, they would get a visualization such as this to demonstrate here's where you were assigned uh, to one or the other, or here's where you had AFib. And we had a R program running in the background that reported a probability their purported trigger really did influence their AFib. They then had a month to kind of digest that information, potentially change their lifestyle. All along at the same time, there was a control group that was just tracking their AFib. So unfortunately, we were unable to demonstrate a difference in our primary outcome, that being this AFEQT, which is a validated questionnaire uh, related to AFib-related quality of life. But interestingly, when we looked at the, the, the real-time re reporting of AFib in that month, uh, there was more 
among those that were just tracking their AFib and less in those randomly assigned to undergo their N of one testing, suggesting maybe they really did learn something helpful uh, during their N of one trial. Then the question is, okay, of the people who tested different triggers, are there certain exposures that, that seem to be useful or, or important? In intention to treat, nothing came out. You'll notice that alcohol here at the top is, is uh, not statistically significant, but is, is the furthest to the right past one. But in per protocol analysis, alcohol actually did achieve statistical significance. Interestingly, caffeine uh, did not, and if anything, is to the left side of one. Uh, so again, demonstrating there really seems to be something about alcohol specifically. Now, when people see this figure, I, I've learned uh, I can't ignore uh, this, um, this uh, custom uh, uh, category, which really was customized, and you see it's quite idiosyncratic but includes stress, uh, which hopefully it also explains why this is, came out in the per protocol. We couldn't randomly assign people, uh, I, I guess you could come up with an experiment where you randomly assign people to be more or less stressed, but uh, it only came out in the, in the per protocol. So in conclusions, uh, physical activity is good. Uh, we should encourage that among our patients. And very importantly, by the way, for people who have a fit, this is a common question, can I exercise? What if I have an episode of AFib? At the very least, they should be very reassured that it's safe to exercise. So that should not, that's not a reason to have them curtail their activity. Smoking's bad, uh, and we will learn more about the effects on offspring. Other drugs also not good for AFib, including cannabis, as far as we can tell. One of the ongoing studies we have now that Gabby and Gracie are enrolling in is called Mary Jane. Uh, where we are essentially doing Crave, but with inhaled cannabis. So let me know if you'd like to uh, enroll in that study. Uh, alcohol increases the risk for both the eventual development of AFib as well as the risk of a discrete episode. The good news there is there is evidence that avoidance really can still meaningfully reduce risk. Enjoy your coffee. Uh, I don't recommend starting coffee, uh, but if you enjoy it, please continue. Another study we're doing called DCAF, does eliminating coffee avoid fibrillation? Also Gabby Gracie doing an awesome job enrolling uh, patients, which is very difficult because people don't want to give up their coffee. Any patient coming to UCSF or cardioversion who drinks coffee will be invited uh, and they are asked to either avoid coffee or continue to drink and we will learn, does it really influence subsequent AFib? Finally, there is substantial heterogeneity and individual idiosyncrasies that remain unelucidated. So there's lots of research to do and much to learn uh, to optimally inform our patients and the public. And finally, uh, thank you all for your attention. And this is all a major team effort uh, uh, with a thank you and acknowledgement to many who have helped with much of this research. Thank you all. Thank you, Greg. What a tour de force in terms of the amount of work and the interesting questions and methods you've used to, uh, to answer them. Uh, what's your theory of the case about why coffee would not be a trigger? Yeah. So several reasons that coffee may not, not only be a trigger, but also may theoretically be beneficial. And again, this decaf study will be very interesting to see what we find. One is uh, there is a relationship between autonomic tone and AFib, but it seems to be predominantly more of a vagal thing, a vagal effect. Interestingly, there are probably different phenotypes. So there are probably some with vagal AFib and some with more sympathetically mediated AFib. It does appear that the majority have more of the vagal type. So it's possible a little bit more catecholamines as, or an effect of caffeine might be protective against that. Uh, there's also evidence that coffee may be anti-inflammatory, um, which, uh, and again, as I mentioned earlier, inflammation clearly increases the risk for AFib, if not can be totally causal. There's also interesting interactions with adenosine. I, I, I suspect uh, the doses I'm about to refer to are too high to be relevant, but we know that adenosine, so when you give adenosine uh, to a patient to terminate their SVT, it can also trigger AFib. And we see that in the, in the EP lab, caffeine inhibits effects of adenosine. Um, so several potential explanations. I can just get you to connect the dots on, you mentioned early on that there was this whole movement over the past 20 or 30 years that, that uh, rhythm control is not important. A lot of your talk, it really is predicated on these are the things that might put you in this rhythm and that that's not good for you. 
do we know that? Do we know that the paroxysmal AFib caused by your drink or your, your marijuana or whatever it is, is actually bad for you? Yeah, so uh, several things. So this the very important study published in the New England Journal ESNET 4 was uh, just in the last couple of years was the first to demonstrate that random assignment to a rhythm control strategy really can reduce the risk for heart outcomes, including stroke. One of the problems with the older trials, such as Affirm, is that if someone came to clinic, they're randomly assigned to uh, rhythm control. They come to clinic, they're in normal sinus rhythm, the, uh, the um, practitioner could stop their warfarin. That's a big one. So what we've learned is rhythm control is not a substitute for anticoagulation. And it appears that rhythm control plus anticoagulation in properly selected patients really does substantially uh, improve outcomes. Almost certainly DOACs have helped improve because the risk of intracranial hemorrhage is so much lower. Uh, also the means to obtain and maintain sinus rhythm are much better in a couple of ways. Ablation is by far clearly more effective on average than antiarrhythmic drugs. Uh, that was not available in the time of a firm. We've also learned how to customize appropriate selection of individual antiarrhythmic drugs for in individual patients uh, in safer ways. Uh, so that even just based on drugs, I think we can more commonly achieve and maintain sinus rhythm in, in a safer, more appropriate way. Yeah, I'm sure it's its own talk, so don't go into great detail, but today when you see someone with AFib, uh, do, you, do you go right to ablation as a recommendation versus, uh, versus drugs? Yeah, so uh, whether they're symptomatic or not still really matters. <clears throat> it can be tough to determine if they're symptomatic. So some, you know, if they're symptomatic, I, currently the recommendation is either ablation or a drug as first line, at least give it a shot. Uh, if, if they are asymptomatic, first you wanna really make sure they're asymptomatic. So sometimes someone comes in with persistent AFib and they're just kind of dragging. And I very frequently would do a cardioversion to test how they feel. Some patients amazingly cardiovert them, they're in sinus rhythm, they say, yeah, I don't feel any different. For them, I'm not gonna be that aggressive. The data for benefit uh, absence symptoms is really in the uh, more recent onset AFib, where the, the thought is that you can halt the harmful progression, atrial remodeling, perhaps worsening of TR, uh, tricuspid regurgitation, mitral regurg, uh, and that's where the most benefit has been shown in terms of the harder outcomes. Okay. Any questions on that? Yeah. Thanks, Greg. That was Rita Redberg, cardiology. That, that was great. And as you really have contributed so much to our understanding of AFib and as a participant in the PRAVE trials, you didn't cheat. That's <laughs> but but it was hard. <laughs> was that but, was that you who bought that seventeen dollar cup of coffee? <laughs> <laughs> seventeen dollar cup of coffee I went to nowhere. Um, but I did want to just uh, challenge your last point because I don't recommend ablation as a first line therapy. I don't think. I mean, to me, we don't have any randomized control trial with a sham control on subjective endpoints. And you know what I've learned from all of this monitoring is people have no idea when they're in AFib or not, because if then they keep a diary, you know, their symptoms are when they're in sinus, when they're in AFib. I mean, it, it, it's very variable and, it, and it, there are sham controls and there are risks to AFib ablation. And so I, I just wanted to, you know, unless there's data I'm missing, I'm still <laughs> waiting. That yeah. placebo control are you know, yeah. so aggressively because you know, we do have meds and, and you can live with it. Yeah, fair enough, Rita. Um, thanks for the comment. Thanks for your participation. And I, uh, just for those who may not have been able to hear uh, Rita's question is there, uh, or her comment is that there is no sham controlled uh, randomized study regarding ablation, which is fair enough and, and very true. Um, we, you know, there have been randomized trials of ablation. Um, but admittedly, either ablation or, or not. So the, the question, I think the, the you know, pure skeptic would say, well, maybe there's something about having a procedure, having these catheters put in that um, psychologically uh, is affecting the, the perception of outcome. Um, there have been now uh, uh, some trials to demonstrate, admittedly not sham, especially in heart failure, interestingly, which is backwards from how we used to think about it, that those are the patients that seem to benefit the most, the Castle AF uh, trial, for example, showing uh, benefit in terms of mortality. So not uh, relying on how the person feels, 
more and more of these ablation trials do rely on the implantable loop recorder or some sort of continuous monitoring that have clearly shown differences, also differences in progression of AFib. Um, I mean, I, I'm a big fan of being skeptical and being rigorous, so I, um, uh, but that, you know, that's my, my response, but we should always be skeptical and open-minded to other possibilities. Yes, one last question. So as you counsel, let's say a 30-year-old about alcohol or marijuana or whatever, I would assume that even if the relative risk is higher, that the absolute risk is extremely low at that age. And so do you think differently about your recommendations about these potential stimulants of AFib in a 70-year-old versus a 30-year-old because the, the actual impact on, on risk is very, very different, I would, I would assume. Yeah, it's, it's, there's an interesting almost paradox in terms of the uh, relative risk which in younger people tends to be huge versus the absolute risk, which is indeed small. The counter to that is that the, the cumulative risk. So yes, in terms of the acute uh, risk, it's probably, it's certainly much lower in the younger, but I think it's actually in the younger folks where uh, establishing uh, good habits or healthy habits is going to be the most helpful to them over the long term, given evidence that alcohol seems to have this cumulative harmful effect probably cannabis does as well. Greg, thanks so much. That was terrific. Really appreciate it. Thank you.